The bandwidth for this episode of the AR-15 Podcast is sponsored by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Welcome to episode number 115 of the AR-15 Podcast. I'm your host, Reed Snyder, and with me tonight is Anthony Hardy with our special guest, Carmen Lout. This is the podcast about your favorite black rifle. The show is for you whether you're building your first AR or you've been building ARs for years. There's something we can all do to take our black rifle to the next level. Well, hi, guys. How are you all doing tonight? Howdy, howdy. Hi, doing great. Well, we have been busy here at the AR-15 podcast uh, putting together tonight's show, and I hope it's a timely one. Um, But before we get started, we wanted to let you know that Brownells helps make this show possible. And uh, we want to remind you not to forget that Brownells, with their 100% lifetime satisfaction guarantee, is there for you anytime you have a problem. Like when you can't remove the taper pins from your new barrel to slip off the front side base, and you now have to find a new barrel. So uh, this week, I want to illustrate that Brownells has something called the EDGE program that they've instituted and initiated, I think, in conjunction with their 75th anniversary. Um, But it is a program that provides free standard shipping on all your orders, uh, discounts on two-day and overnight shipping, free return shipping, which uh, you can't beat when you have to send a whole bunch of stuff back, like barrels, (laughs) <laughs> uh, and uh, special members only offers and discounts. Yeah, so this is the Amazon Prime, huh? Well, no, this is the Brownells Edge. Very well, similar. That's what I'm though, yeah, but... this is this is Brownells version of Amazon Prime. Yeah. But that's um, cool. we want to remind you that if you have a need for any AR-15 parts, go ahead and shop for your parts at Brownells. You can go to Brownells by following through our link on the AR15Podcast.com website at ar15podcast.com forward slash parts. So anything you guys can do to help would be much appreciated. Well, Anthony, Carmen, um, we've been talking about the ATF's proposed ban of the M855 ammunition. Um, It's been a rousing discussion, and so we're going to kind of lay it all out for all of you listeners um, as we've kind of uh, gone through and, and talked about it amongst ourselves. and So uh, let's kind of start off with, uh, do, uh, do either of you guys have a good idea of what the M855 round is? Carmen, we're all looking at you since you're the competitive uh, expert here. I have, I have never shot one, no, I have not. Um, I I became more educated as this discussion came up, just trying to investigate exactly what everybody was talking about. Now, I will tell you that I like the 855 round. I've uh, fired it in a lot of my uh, 107 twist ARs. It's a heavier projectile. It's a 62 grain projectile, so it's a little heavier than the 55 grain. Uh, When the 55 grain was implemented, it was implemented in barrels that did not have as fast a twist rate. And okay. so the performance envelope was changed when they went to these faster barrels. And, of course, with a shorter barrel, you have another factor that goes into what right. that caliber is going to do for you. Interesting. Yeah, did you see the, um, as a side note, did you see the, um, I forget which website it was now. I th- actually, I think I won't mention which website it was. Um, we all know, but uh, they, the day after all this was announced, there was what it was like eight hundred dollars for so many rounds or whatever they they were price gouging. Yeah. Oh yeah. By accident. Yeah. Supposedly yeah. it was by accident. There was an apology that came out like the next day, which is cool. But um, I, I saw that and I thought this looks kind of familiar. And it turned out uh, the week before the announcement, I had been looking for some two two three five five six, and I was in Walmart, and the only box they had was some American Eagle M eight fifty five. And so I've got a, I've got a box of it sitting in the closet. I thought, well, that timing was rather nice. That was very fortuitous. Yes. Um, so it is originally from I think the SS109, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, but it's either uh, Belgian or the Netherlands um, that was making it, and NATO adopted it. 
And when NATO adopted it, that meant the U.S. government had to adopt it because we are core members of NATO, and that's what we do. Right. Um, but, you know, the round has been a part of the arsenal for quite some time. It's been in civilian hands for decades. I think it's 20 years now. And realistically, I mean, I think it's as common as the 193 or, you know, just anything else that you're going to see on a shelf at a, you know, at a gun store, at uh, your local Cabela's or Bass Pro or whoever. But the ATF decided to ban it. So I think that uh, that has caused a lot of panic amongst our brothers and sisters in the firearms industry who uh, really don't take kindly to the ATF uh, just arbitrarily doing things. So, uh, Carmen, as you kind of come to understand this furor, kind of when did it really take for you that this was something to be worried about? Um, actually, yesterday I was talking with some friends, and and they were quite serious about it. And I've received some emails from the NRA a couple of days ago, and I just disregarded them honestly. I thought that it was hype and it was a bandwagon. And I think the day before yesterday, I saw a statement from Ted Nugent, and I thought, wait a minute, he really doesn't say anything. And then I was actually at an ammo factory today, at a production facility, and they were talking a lot about it. Um, and then I spoke to to Anthony earlier today, and I thought, wow, yeah, I really, really need to wake up and start reading and educating myself more about this because this is something we need to be on top of. Well, why don't we kind of cover the, I guess, the foundational laws? the ATF is trying to use to ban the ammunition. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you what the sites are, and then we'll get into a discussion. Yes, boys and girls, this is the um, the fun part of the show where we have a party. As no, we deal with is, the legalese. This, this is where the, the, the frustrated lawyer pretends he's a you know Ivy League professor. Um, no, Good, so the, uh, the code section is... Uh, uh, Title 18 of the United States Code, uh, Section 921A17C, Sub B, uh, is the definition of armor-piercing ammunition for our purposes. And so um, it's in the show notes. I'm going to go through this quickly, so you may not catch it all, but if you want to go back to the show notes, you can find the site and you can read it at your own pace. So an armor-piercing ammunition is a projectile or projectile core which may be used in a handgun and which is constructed entirely excluding the presence of trace or other substances from one or a combination of tungsten, alloy, steel, iron, brass, bronze, beryllium, copper, or depleted uranium. Or a full-jacketed projectile larger than 22 caliber designed and intended for use in a handgun and whose jacket has a weight of more than 25% of the total weight of the projectile. So let me go ahead and talk to you about the next piece, which is why that's important, and that's 18, Title 18, United States Code, Section 922, A7 and A8. And they basically say that it is illegal for a person to manufacture or import armor-piercing ammo and it is illegal for any manufacturer or importer to sell or deliver armor-piercing ammo. So, you have a definition that defines armor-piercing, and then you have the section that says what happens if you're doing these things with armor-piercing. Mm -hmm. So, we've talked at length, guys, about what the 855 is and whether or not it's even subject to the definition. So I basically have come to the conclusion and you know although I am a lawyer it's just my conclusion and I'll probably be proven wrong if it were left up to the judiciary but um, if the 855 projectile is 80 percent lead then 
uh, the other components being uh, copper and steel uh, can't be a uh, constructed entirely of those. Uh, you makes, makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you should say that it's constructed almost entirely of lead with a percentage of steel and copper. So it's, in my opinion, not armor-piercing ammunition. Now, of course, that is of very little uh, relevance in this case because that really has never been something that the ATF or any court, as far as I know, has taken on as a matter of uh, distinction or uh, an item to be clarified. I think at one point someone just decided that the 855 was supposed to be armor-piercing, so it was supposed to be on the list, and then someone applied for an exemption. To me, well, that sounds... The question Go ahead. With in intent, I mean, as an attorney, and I hear law and order, the intent, criminal intent, um, <laughs> doesn't that matter? Because I'm looking here, and I just realized that I've, I've shot uh, M855 before in a, a Springfield 30-06, and high power competitions um, at, at targets that were a thousand yards away. Um, my intent was to pierce the paper, the cardboard on the target. It doesn't doesn't that play a role here? I mean, I purchased a car. My intent is not to run over someone, but it's to drive. You know, the problem that you have here is that this is not a criminal declaration. What this is saying is among these categories of things that the ATF has the power to control, which are really you know, the things that society thinks of as dangerous, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, and you know, really, I mean, that sounds like a, a great day in, you know, the foothills of Virginia or, you know, the backwoods of Pennsylvania to me. I mean, anytime we can get a bunch of guys together with, you know, guns, booze, tobacco, and explosives, it's a great afternoon. Yeah, right. But <clears throat> so, you know, I think the distinction you have to make here is that as an agency, what they're doing is saying these are things that you just can't play with. You can't have these things. Nobody can have hand grenades. You know, we don't want you to have, you know, uh, a a still in the backwoods so you can run moonshine to the local A&P. And in this instance, they decided that we can't have armor-piercing ammunition. Um, is this good law or bad law? You know, I don't want someone getting armor-piercing ammunition who is going to be a criminal and who is going to do what these people were concerned about when they passed the law, which was shoot a cop. I don't want that to happen. I don't want police officers to die because somebody can buy a projectile designed to kill them. I, I get that. But we have, I believe, a an agency that has overstepped the boundaries of its charter to implement an agenda of an administration and they have done what good dedicated soldiers do for their their commanders they figured out a way to accomplish the mission and the bureaucratic snafu that allowed someone to say hey this non armor piercing stuff must be armor piercing let's put it on the list and ask for an exemption that was just a bureaucratic snafu it was never, according to this definition, subject to being definitionally called armor piercing. So why was it included? I can only think that it was an error. But since it's there, since they had an exemption, they've taken the next pretextual step, which is to say we're going to make it no longer exempt and ban it, which means that if it is, as they say, armor-piercing ammunition, then subject to 
922A7 and 8, we can't get it from retailers. Well, I so, dare say that there are more people die on a daily basis from cigarette smoking, secondhand cigarette smoke, and alcohol mm -hmm. consumption and alcohol-related uh, incidences. So I think the ATF needs to concentrate more on that because <laughs> I I don't even think I've I've heard the last time that someone in the U.S. died because of armor-piercing ammunition. And I stand mm -hmm. behind the men, men and women in blue. I'm I'm a huge proponent for law enforcement. However, yeah. comma, I can't tell you the last time that I heard of one getting getting shot with quote unquote armor piercing ammunition. You're absolutely Something right. Else. You know, and here's another thing. I think that there was a period in time where we as a nation thought that things were going you know, in the crapper. Everything was going to heck in a handbasket and people were trying to do things to stop it. Well, I think they were ill-informed. They were things done in haste and I think that in retrospect, as we have looked back, they have done nothing to change what they were most afraid of. And in fact, the things that changed, changed because of other reasons that had nothing to do with the laws that were passed. And so I think we've pretty definitively established that it was a lark. It was an absolute farce. Uh, assault rifle ban was a farce. You know, you look at the things that these laws were designed to protect us from and they never came to pass. Um, the people that were the criminals were always going to continue to do the things they did to get the things they wanted. I mean, it was ridiculous. And, and now we're left with this muddy patchwork of rules and laws that really don't help us and right now we have an administration whose intent is to basically damage us. So Reed, let me ask. I'm still trying, I mean I understand the, the basic concept of everything. That's, that's not an issue at all. I'm trying to wrap my head around some of the history of this. I'm finding a whole lot of stuff from 2011. Um, where they're talking about his M855 armor piercing and that kind of stuff. And, and you talked about it having been on the list and having come off the list. And so is it a fact that someone um, asked for an exception and that's what pulled it off the list? Or is that just that's what you believe probably happened? Or Well, there's some ATF guidance explaining what it was that they're doing. And in that guidance, they basically explained that a request for an exemption was filed with them gotcha, for okay. M855 ammunition. Do I know that? Am I aware of that? You know, I'm not. Uh, it but it's is from just, the ATF documentation. Yeah, it's from a, a PDF explaining their uh, approach to what they're doing. And we have linked to that, uh, if, if anyone wants to read that, to the ATF documentation in the show notes underneath uh, reference materials. Well, we don't yet, you know, because I closed it out. <laughs> I'll no, I've already, I've already done that, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, here's the thing. When it comes down to it, these issues are administrative. They are bureaucratic. This is a bureaucracy that is going in trying to do its thing. Oh, and before we get too far... Anthony, you may want to send Carmen a copy of the link so she can get back to us. Um, so uh, she should have it on Facebook. Yeah. When it comes down to it, Carmen, there you are. Can't get rid of me. What? So um, we were just talking about the the whole um, source of the. Uh, comment that somebody requested an exemption. Right. I saw somewhere that there were, I believe, 30 uh, the ATF reported receiving 30 requests for exemption. Yes. And, you know, a request for an exemption does not make it something that needs to have an exemption. You know, I can request a tax stamp for my completely legal, you know, pistol telling the government it's a machine gun, but that doesn't make it a machine gun. 
So my question is, from whom did these requests originate? From general citizens? From lawmakers? You know, um, I would say they probably came from manufacturers. And my guess is that someone just decided to do a belt and suspenders approach to making sure they wouldn't get shut out. You know, I get it. Um, you know, sometimes on the tax side of things, which is more in line with my core understanding, people request, um, it's a PLR, it's a private letter ruling. Mm -hmm. you tell the IRS your circumstances and you tell them what you think is going to happen and you ask them to bless it. And they'll come back and they'll say, okay, well, you're blessed. You can do that. It's okay. Now, what the rules say is that if I have a PLR, Carmen, you can't go out and rely on it. So if you're doing the same exact thing, and next month I knock on your door and say, I'm with the IRS, I'm here to help you, I want to see all your books, this is an audit, you're, you're in the thick of it. I'm right. still protected, but you're not. Right. So if I'm a manufacturer of, you know, the M855 stuff, not a primary government contractor, someone who could lose a lot if they said I can't sell it because I've just had to retool and do all this other stuff, I'd want to go to the ATF and say, look, I want an exemption. I want you to tell me it's going to be okay for me to do this. Right. That's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, asking for an exemption does not put it on the list. So... I think that you really have a confusing starting point for what the ATF is doing. I don't know that there's any way to get around where they're starting from because that's it's just where we find ourselves. You can't go back and replow that ground. It's already done. Yeah, the, the necessity for an exemption inherently means that there's a problem. Well, I would point out that there's a whole bunch of people in my profession who operate day to day on the idea that um, it's scary so let's just go and double check ourselves. It's a possibility even though it's so remote dinosaurs will come back to the planet before this happens. Let's go get someone to you know give us a little bit of reassurance. You know, we're it's, not worried it's, about ISIS. I'm just saying and we have other things that we're, we're going after this. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know I hear you, and the only thing that I can think is that with six years out of eight of an administration already gone, and all of the promises of control, gun control, whatever, that were thrown out and talked about and bandied about, not having come to pass, at the moment in time when control over the House and the Senate has slipped through their grasp, I mean, this is it. This is the last hurrah. This is their only way to get anything done. And what do they got to lose? They'll be gone in two years, and somebody else has to pick up the pieces. Perhaps it's a little bit of distraction from the epic fail of Obamacare and how people are starting to realize how he was trying to take advantage of the American people. And so now, in the famous words of Hillary Clinton, what does it matter? We're not worried about Obamacare. Now we're worried about, you know, you know armor-piercing ammunition, because that sounds so serious, doesn't it? You know, <clears throat> I, I don't know. You have to think that for all of the really dumb things that have happened in, you know, the halls of power in our government, um, it would be pretty crafty for them to have orchestrated these things on purpose. I mean, I think that it is just one more of the series of blundering steps that are undertaken by the the, the administration that we have. Um, you know, and I guess it really kind of leads us to the next question that we have in our show notes, which is, can they really do this? Can they really ban the ammunition? And so I'm going to tell you what my thought is, and you know it goes back to the issue of you know how much intelligence is there behind this. 
but when someone says, can they really do it? Well, yes, they can, because they're the ATF. That's their job to do it. Right. Will it stick? Well, that's a different question. But can they do this? Yes, until someone tells them not to. So here's who can tell them not to. The president can tell them not to. Not gonna right happen. now, I don't think we have one that will. Right. Congress can tell them not to. The difficulty is that for Congress to tell them not to, they have to pass the law, which means it has to be signed by the president or they have to have a supermajority in the Senate to overrule a veto. Right. Uh, we're at 40% support in the House right now, but hopefully that well, will be that's fine, but the House isn't the Senate. Yeah, it's no They're not going to get it through a veto. Yep, exactly. Um, and, you know, the third option is the leg or the judiciary. And I think that, that right now is our biggest shot at stopping this. But, <coughs> excuse me, can they do it? I think absolutely. My fear is if they can stop the production and if they can get manufacturers to, if they can force manufacturers to either abandon production lines or retool for other ammunition, um, I think that they might have the power to make it so economically painful to go back to manufacturing it we might not see it on the open market even if it were made legal once again. Right. Um, if we have another uh, democratic administration, I think that there is an even greater likelihood that that could happen um, if it is not two years before we have a change in administration but ten. Um, I think you're really looking at the possibility that ten years from now the 855 will be something in the history books because they'll have gone past it so far. Something else is in their hands. Um, I think that there's also the risk that this is a domino effect, that this is the opening salvo in a sequence of steps to move the line closer and closer to just conventional rifle ammunition, uh, thereby, you know, getting rid of the possibility that people can buy AR-15s because there won't be any ammunition, you know. If they can do that, well, then I think that there's really a problem with that part of the industry that we're all familiar with. You'll have to forgive me. I'm sure. dealing with it's, a bit of a cold here. So we know they can do it. We know that it can be stopped, and we, we hope that it will be stopped. We know, um, like you said, Reed, the legislature is our, is our best hope. No, not the legislature, sorry. The judicial branch is our best hope right now. So what can we do to help this process along and, and put a stop to this? Well, so here's my thought. And you guys step in with anything that you've come to understand, but... You know, I think what it comes down to is that we need to get involved. If we're in the middle, if we are the people that have historically taken that 70% out of the center, who don't lean too far one way or too far the other way, and this is important to you, then you're going to have to stand up. You're going to have to be counted. You're going to have to let the sound of your voices crash against the walls of power and let them know that you want this to stop. And the 70% in the middle are the ones that they'll go either way. They'll sometimes be Republican, sometimes be Democrat, sometimes be both. That's fine. But the issue is, is if this is important to you, you have to stand up. And when the right plus the middle stands up, that's most of this nation. That's a majority by far. That's 70% plus of this nation. And if they can stand up, if that's who stands behind this, then 
I think you're going to have some real second thoughts at those levels of authority. Um, but for those of us who are right here, who are in the thick of it, who have a voice, who are using a voice, who are saying things, I think that we need to make the sacrifices necessary to keep talking about this and to keep spreading the word and to get more involved. Um, I have to tell you that it's it's really nice being in a state like Texas and a city like I live in because it's about as conservative as you can get. I can skip every vote in this area till the end of time and it won't matter because here it doesn't go any other way. But we need to abandon that idea. We need to let our voices be heard. We need to go out and we need to show that we are serious and we're involved. And so that means standing up and voting. That means going out and letting people know what we think and writing our legislators and writing our, our elected officials at every level to say, hey, look, this matters to me and I want you to say something. I want you to represent me and let my voice be heard. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I got out of the Marine Corps um, and it took a while for them to do my paperwork. Bureaucrats, I get it. I wrote my senator and I wrote my congressman. After they received the letters inside of three days, my paperwork was at my home from California to Texas. Your voice matters to the people you elect. And when they hear enough of them, they will stand up and make heaven and earth move because that's what they want to do to make their constituents happy. But you've got to let them know. And at the same time, you have to fund and help support the institutions that go out and act as your advocates in these issues. And I'm not going to tell you who you should support. I'm not going to tell you who you should fund. But if there is somebody that you can believe in and stand behind who advocates for your beliefs, give them the resources they need. And if that's your time, if that's your money, give it to them willingly and freely. The problem, Folks, I think... Uh, if you want to be stand up and to stand up and be counted, uh, go over to our social media sites. I am posting all the links you need to contact your legislators. Get in touch with them. Let them know how you feel. Very important. Now, you know, <clears throat> from from my side of this as a view, my concern is always that at the moment that we fail to do something and something becomes entrenched, the job of changing it for the better becomes astronomically harder. Um, prohibition came into being because of a huge outcry against alcohol and everything that came in with prohibition created such a huge outcry that they got rid of it. Those were two constitutional amendments that happened in very short order. You know, we haven't really had much on that magnitude happen for some time. Um, if we stand up and roar, they're going to hear and they're going to do something. It's happened before and it happens every time we do it. We just have to quit being lazy and go out and do it. So I, I think that's what we can do about it. And you know, I think Carmen brought up a good point. You know, we work. We have nine to five lives. We have families. We have obligations. We have commitments to the people that care about us and the people we care about. Um, it, it's not like the, the days when we could just, you know, throw a bag in a car, drive across country, and be somewhere because we wanted to. Um, 
but you know, if something means enough to you, you sometimes have to make sacrifices. And I'm not talking about, you know, counterculture, you know, anti-establishment stuff. You know, if the, the sacrifice is finding the local politician that supports your views and volunteering for their staff when the next election happens, then volunteer. You know, if the sacrifice is a little more out of your budget to support an institution or a candidate or something that is going to further your, uh, you know, your voice and let it be carried uh, louder, then then make the sacrifice. But if we don't make the sacrifices, these things are going to disappear with a whimper, and we're going to catch hell trying to get them turned off and turned around. And you know that's just not a good place to be if you are really, really fervent in your support of the Second Amendment. So, um, what do you guys think? Well, it seems to me there's a, a good legal case. Um, I've read... Not only the the piece that you've talked about, Reed, with dealing with um, the percentage of lead versus the percentage of other items within the bullet, I've also read about the intent behind the manufacturing of the ammo. It's very clearly uh, designed to be used in a rifle, even though it can be used in a pistol. So can anything. So I think that you know there there are several legs that that are there to stand on from a a, a standpoint of the law. I hope that it works. Well, you know, and that's the thing. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. Right. But that's why you have to care, and that's why you have to stay vocal. Um, you know, it's not that the system's bad. It's just that the system is designed so that nobody can jump in and, you know, turn it on us on a dime. Nobody wants a dictator. Um, so we have a system that it would be really hard for someone to become that. Uh, by the same token, that system isn't one that can turn quickly when things like this get, you know, a full head of steam. And the ATF has had quite a few years of steam on these issues. Um, they've taken a number of calibers and ammunition types and put them on a banned list, and nobody gave it a second thought. Nobody challenged it. Nobody did anything. And would it have changed anything? I don't know. You know, I don't know enough about the Russian ammos that were banned. I don't know enough about what's transpired in these last few years. But I do know that with all of that steam behind the ATF, they're going to be harder to stop now. So we just have to be vocal and we just have to stay vocal. Um, so likely outcomes. <clears throat> well, either it's going to be banned or not. But uh... well, here's my thought. Um, in the short term, I think it's, and and I don't know enough about the you know procedural side of it, but I think it may be possible to get an injunction against uh, implementation of the law on the theory of the harm, irreparable harm and damage it would cause to the people affected. And if they can stop it at that level, it may take three or four years. <coughs> Excuse me. It may take three or four years for it to become uh, overturned in the courts or become law, and hopefully in a couple of years, uh, when it becomes an issue, it'll be a different administration putting the brakes on it. Um, in the near term, there's always a possibility of a fast-track appeal, um, and that may tie it up in the interim between now and the end of the current administration. Um, there's always the possibility that it could just come to pass, and the industry is able to hold off production for a few years without too much harm. And if we have a change in administrations at the end of this two-year period, maybe they'll 
make them okay again. And uh, I think that if everybody is fighting hard, I don't think it is likely that they'll be successful in banning the ammunition. I just hope they're not successful in making it so unproductive, unprofitable, unnecessary to manufacture it that by the time they score a victory, nobody's interested anymore. It's death by red tape. Yeah, essentially. Um, you know, I, I propose that this is a pretextual attempt to impose an agenda on us. That it has nothing to do with the handgun, it has nothing to do with the construction of the bullet, it has nothing to do with laws or deaths or anything other than the fact that the administration that we have leading the country wants to make firearms less relevant. And this is the only tool that I think is really left to them as we sit here today. So, so are you a betting man, Reed? I am, but I usually only bet on dice. And <laughs> not very well. So you, you don't want to make a prediction of any kind here? You know, no, I don't. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I can do, and I'm going to do that. And I I'm going to hope that everybody else does the same. They do what their heart leads them to do. They do what their um, belief and faith in our country tells them to do. And you know what? If, if they don't side with me, then that's fine. Stand up and be counted. I don't really care what side of this you're on. Stand up and be counted because at the end, if everybody stands up and they're counted, if those of us who appreciate and love everything about the Second Amendment or 30% of the country, then guess what? We really aren't the majority. But if we're 70, 80, 90% of the country, well then by golly, I think that needs to be made clear as well. So stand up, everybody. Everybody stand up, not just the squeaky wheels. All of the very quiet, well-greased ones in the middle. So does this count? <laughs> For those of you um, that are not watching the video, which is the majority of you, I actually just stood up. So it's kind of lame, but funny. Well, that's all right. To me. So, you know, I know that I've kind of laid out this, this discussion here, but what do you guys think? You know, personally, I'm really offended that our government's doing this. Yeah, it's a, the American Revolution. I, I think um, it is about solidarity. I think that every time that this administration especially proposes a ban on something, firearms related, they're slowly but surely getting more and more of their foot into the door. And I think a lot of times they know that it's not going to pass. It's going to be an epic fail. But that doesn't matter to them because then the next time they propose something else, the, the public gets more and more immune to these attempts. And it's, oh, well, it's not such a big deal because two years ago they attempted to ban XYZ. So it's not as big of a deal. And I think a lot of times, maybe in this case, this round, a lot of people don't use this round. And so there's this complacent, well, I'm busy, I'm not too worried about it, it probably won't happen, I don't use that round anyway, I don't see what the big deal is. And so then they sneak these things in and a lot of people don't notice. So I think that, like Reed said, it's solidarity is very important because you're not really standing up for this round, you're standing up for gun rights in general, you're standing up for our freedoms, for our liberties. You know, I, and I think that that's an interesting point that you, you started there. It's not about this round, because this is just the beginning. They're closer with this round than they would be with a lead projectile. But they were closer to armor piercing with the last thing they banned. 
if they keep going from the very close to the further and further away things, all of a sudden there isn't going to be anything you can feed in AR because it's all banned. If they have the power by fiat to just say, hey, you know what, the 855 is armor piercing, let's call the you know XM193 stuff armor piercing. Let's ban it now. Oh, and you know what? Well, we really don't like any of that soft tip stuff. And well, you know, there's the open tip stuff, and well, now we've got that varmint stuff. You know, let's ban all that too. Well, I mean, at, at what point are we going to sit there and find ourselves with nothing on the shelves that we can feed these rifles? And it would be different if it were a panel of firearms experts, subject matter experts. But, but these are the same people who call what one feeds into a Glock, they call this a clip. They don't even know the proper terminology, and they're trying to make decisions that affect our civil liberties. Right. It's, it just it doesn't make any sense. No. And you know what? It, it's not going to. You know, I think that, that what we have to remember is that it's not whether it makes sense, it's whether or not we're willing to voice our opinion of it. And it's the whole thing you said, solidarity. We have to stand together. We have to be that roar that says this is not going to be tolerated. It stops here. Um, no more slippery slope. <laughs> And it affects this, no matter how easy it is to say, well, I don't even shoot that round. No, mm -hmm. it does affect you, because years down the road, oh, well, yeah, remember they well, they, they banned that, of course. Well, now this makes sense, too. We don't even need a two two three round anymore. Right. That's that's where it's going. Yeah, because so, what, what is it? You've got several states that don't allow hunting with the two two three, so that, that kind of makes it less popular. Exactly. So they're, they're, if you follow that line of reasoning down that road, again, um, as you guys can see, if you're watching the video, I have a big slippery slope sign up on the screen in place of my face. Um, that's where we are. We've got to stop that uh, slippery slope. We can't go down it. What was the case that we found from a couple of years ago where they wanted to ban ammunition for hunting purposes because it had lead, and they said that it would poison the wildlife? Right. And, you know, the courts basically poured them out. At some point, they said, you can't do that. Right. And, you know, I'm not as steeped in the, the lore of that line of cases because we won and the issue was moot. But I think it may very well have been Congress stepped in and said, look, we're not going to let you do this. We're going to make an exemption for ammunition or something. I, I can't remember exactly how it came to pass. But, you know. Well, and I think it's part of the absurdity that makes us complacent. Oh, that's yeah. so crazy. That that will never pass, and so people stand down when, mm -hmm. in fact, it does because nobody stands up. Right, right, absolutely. Um, I want to, um, Anthony, I want you to read uh, the statement from Eric Lund, who uh, kindly provided us a statement to include in the, the show um, because he was unfortunately unable to join us tonight. You bet. The notion that the ATF is only trying to protect our nation's law enforcement officers from armor-piercing bullets is a complete fabrication and utter nonsense. M855 ammunition has been available for well over 20 years, and in that time, there is not a single recorded instance of a Leo being killed by this specific ammunition. M855 ammunition does not even meet the ATF's own guidelines for what constitutes an actual armor-piercing bullet. Virtually any rifle caliber cartridge will penetrate level 3A body armor, which itself was never designed to protect the officer from rifle caliber projectiles, only handgun projectiles. Banning M855 ammunition will not save or protect a single Leo anywhere in the country. It's a fabrication de designed to elicit sympathy from the uninformed masses. The sinister danger in this ban is not the loss of a single type of ammunition to the public in general, but in the preceding, excuse me, but in the precedent setting administrative action that, if successful, will allow the ATF to arbitrarily and capriciously ban any type of projectile that they deem unfit for public use. I think that's well said. And, it's and very well said. Carmen, tell us, Eric Lund is, uh, he comes from a state and then federal law enforcement background of correct. well over 20 years, is that correct? Correct. Some odd. He so, was a Virginia State Trooper. 
I believe, nine years, and he's been a federal agent here in Atlanta for, I believe, 12, I think, 10, 12, for some time. Um, and so, and he's also a competitive shooter. So he, he's well-rounded. And I think his statement's very true. And I just realized something when you said, is, is it just me or does it sound like they're almost trying to work backwards? I mean, he's saying that the, uh, the armor was built for exclusively for pistol ammunition. It was never built to protect um, the wearer from rifle ammunition. Is that correct? That's correct. But, but in this, their part is is not part of the angle of attack on this on this round. The fact that it can be used in a handgun. Well, I think that was one of the stepping points on which they. It's the back door. Yeah. When in fact the armor itself was built to protect from handgun ammunition, right? Right. But Never that's... rifle ammunition. Exactly. But they're worried about being used in a pistol. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can never say that this was started. Hmm? Go ahead. The ban originally started because of advancements in pistol ballistics. I mean, we see them today. There are pistol calibers in various formations that are really far more dangerous than they were 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, you know, people used to scoff at the 380. Now, um, there are, you know, formations of the 380 that people <laughs> wouldn't want to get shot by. You know, 9mm used to be laughed at, and there are formulations of the 9mm cartridges that are really um, very well designed for the intended purpose of defense. And, you know, once again, at the time that these were being um, passed, these laws, these... Uh, protections, it was a different world. And we've moved past that so far that these things are irrelevancies to what the police in the streets face as a general rule. All they're basically doing is using these steps as a pretext for their own agenda. I don't think that there is any foundation for anything they've said uh, that would lead me to believe that this has anything to do with law enforcement, um, pistols, armor piercing, anything. I just, I don't see it. I think it's all pretext for the notion of an agenda that our administration's had for six years. Well, Reed, uh, we've covered this topic top backwards and forwards. I know there's been a lot of... Uh, Discussion all over the web. We've seen articles everywhere um, discussing this. I, I think we've covered all the salient points. Um, do you or Carmen have anything else? No, not at all. But just the deadline is March 16th, right? It is, and I know that there have been some industry uh, participants who've uh, retained counsel. Um, to go out and ask for an extension, a 60-day extension. And, you know, uh, I think the ATF, based on what I've come to understand about um, some of the issues that are being faced right now, the ATF is probably going to grant that because not to grant it would make them subject to maybe harsher criticism from the courts. And if they can get 60 more days and if the groundswell can rise in force and volume, then the ATF may back down. And I think that would be the best outcome. I, I do um, have a question for to you as an attorney. So uh, for, to file an exception, does one have to have an attorney to file an exception? May, may I, as, a, as an individual, as a citizen, write them and ask for an exception? You know, I can't answer that. I would tell you that you should be able to find the provision in the law that says you have the power to do that and the ATF like any other government bureaucracy has a form I am certain you can <laughs> the internet fill out <laughs> um, you know obviously the question there is what is the value of that application without the lawyer I I'll tell you when we talked about a private letter ruling yeah. I mean, the, the 
fee is astronomical. I mean, thousands of dollars fee to file a PLR. But you have to understand they're filed by people who have millions and million dollars of tax on the line, not just monies involved, of tax. And so that's a small price to pay for the reassurance you won't have to pay that tax. Right. And so they hire people that can say everything the right way and paint the right picture and cross the T's and dot the I's. I don't know that the ATF has the same level of involvement with the firearms industry, mm -hmm. but obviously there are some very educated men and women that go out there and deal with some very technical issues with the ATF. So I don't know if that would be of any value. I mean, I think certainly the ATF would just summarily dismiss an application and deny it because right now that's not what their agenda says to do. I was just thinking of a way to inundate them because I, I read somewhere that there were only 30, uh, 30 exceptions that have been filed, and I just thought that was rather odd that there would have been more, but perhaps it's because of what you said. I just thought it would be a way to kind of get their attention. You know... There is a contact person at the ATF whose job it is to field people's comments and suggestions. And I think that if you could, uh, we, I'll have Anthony see if you can put that in the show notes. But that person at the ATF would be someone that you could give that um, comment to and, and tell them what your thoughts are. You know, the, the difficulty is is that you know we're not dealing with a reasonable person who after hearing a number of logical arguments is going to see the light of our position and say you know what that makes sense um, yeah. so I do think the voice of those people who care being heard by the ATF is important even if it's never going to sway them you will be a part of the record and it's a part of that record that will be looked at by legislators that will be looked at by courts that will be looked at by administrations and when the right number of people have said their piece I believe that you can sway those institutions into saying maybe it's a bad idea to do this um, not because of a good argument, but because of fear of what happens if they dismiss the opinions of so many. Um, although I, I wish I was in the business of writing those uh, letters to the ATF. I picked the wrong branch of the legal spectrum to uh, have any shot at that. But... Um, you know, I think we've covered everything. You know, I know that there's probably some more technical details in the round that we could get into, but I don't know that that really helps our discussion. I think as far as final thoughts, the only thing that I can come up with is if you care, then get involved. And if you don't care, be informed. Because I think that if you don't care, then that's the problem. You may not know enough. And if you're informed and you still don't care, hey, at least you did so with all the information available, and that's your right. Yep. Anthony? I mean, I've got to agree. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm clicking around making uh, <laughs> all kinds of notes for the show notes and whatnot, but... <laughs> Regardless as, as to what you think, regardless as to what your position is, I'm sure probably 99.9%, .9 if not 100% of our listeners would be in support of stopping this ban. <clears throat> if you do not stand up and have your voice heard, if you sit back and you say, oh, someone else will take care of this, uh, they won't. You have to stand up. Carmen? I completely agree. You know, whatever it is, I, you gave a, a long list of options earlier, whether it was volunteering or donating funds or whatever you can do. Um, I'm just trying to think of the uh, 
the, the companies that do the clicking, you know, you can pay them to send out emails and pay them to click likes on your athlete page. I'd like to pay some of those people right now just to write just massive amounts of letters. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you got to spare five minutes, start writing letters, writing letters. It does, it does help. Well, listen, Carmen, we'd love to have you on here for the close of the show so we can go through some of our uh, feedback, but we do understand if you've got other better, more important things to do, um, which is shrink in the shadows until you can grace us again. As long as I'm not so, in trouble, I'll stick around. Oh, no, you're not in trouble. Will they, will they, will they be punch and pie? There might be punch and pie at the end, but you have to go out to Alabama. <laughs> Yeah, so. well, you know, I, I, I can, I can come up with something. Well, we want to let you know that the Arrow 15 giveaway winner is Hunter Carr. Congrats to Hunter Carr. Uh, he is our second giveaway winner, and Hunter has now received his rifle, and will be getting back to us uh, when he gets a chance to beat the weather and hit the range. I think he said he was snowed in the last time I talked to him. No, there's no snow. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's Anthony, summertime, isn't you, it? Uh, why don't you catch us up on the next couple of things here? You bet. All right, guys. So the NRA show is coming up um, April 9th through the 12th in Nashville, Tennessee, and I will be attending. So if you're interested in a listener meetup, please post or message us on Facebook or Google Plus or send an email to feedback at ar15podcast.com and let us know if you are interested in a listener meetup in Nashville. Uh, again, we'll be there April 9th through the 12th, and I won't be the only one going. I know we have some of the other hosts from some of the other wonderful podcasts on the Firearms Radio Network, so it won't be uh, won't be just us there. But I don't think, Reed, I don't think you and JW can make it to this one. You guys got shot, though, so. Yeah, well, I'm going to be dealing with uh, filing deadlines uh, right. on uh, April 15th, so I think Big it would time. be prudent for me to be in Nashville while all of my paying clients have their tax returns being ignored. There you go. I just teach them don't don't wait late till the last minute to file. Come on. Not going to worry. Yeah, about it, right? yeah, no. Yeah, so let us know. Let us know. And you can also be sure to look for on social media uh, some of the wonderful things that uh, we were able to find out and see and people were able to meet up there in Nashville at the NRA show. I'll be posting those live from the event. Next, we have our feedback segment, guys. This is where you let us know what's going on with your firearms and what's going on in your life and ask us questions. So we've got a couple of pieces of feedback from our Instagram page, which is doing really, really well. We appreciate you guys uh, coming to us and uh, participating with us. This, is from, this first piece is from Lifestyle Syndicate Boyer. He's got a build that he did. It's a PSA uh, upper and lower with ALG defense in there. He's got Magpul <coughs> furniture on it. It's a really nice uh, looking rifle. I'm uh, a little bit jealous that he's got his own build there. What do you guys think about it? Well, he has Magpul sights. He doesn't have Magpul furniture. I thought I, it was, well, wonder, maybe it was just sights. I, I want to remind the listeners, well, that's why... On a parade, man. Well, we have to remind the listeners, that's why no. uh, Anthony has the, the newbie designation. Yeah, that's right. That's all right. I, well, I haven't actually had my hands on any Magpul. If you want make, to make sure that I get it right, send me something, you know, or wait till I buy it. That's fine. That's what will happen, but that's okay. <laughs> Bring uh, me no, a strawberry. Okay. No, he's got to keep it straight. <laughs> I, if, if Reed doesn't do it, one of the listeners will, so better that it happens now, live on the podcast, and we're all good. All right. So next from DH Cave, um, he posts uh, parts and pieces he's got left over, and he says, decisions, decisions, and what I see there is a little sig brace. He's got yep. an upper and a lower piece together with a little sig brace. I'm thinking he must be going pistol. Well, I hope it's uh, lower that's registered as a pistol. You know, in the back of my mind, every time I see some guy sport his SBR, is that question, did that guy get a tax stamp, or did he just think that he could buy the parts and build it, and it's all okay? Because, you know, it's when not. he meets that first law enforcement officer with that, and he can't come up with the proper licenses or the t proper tax stamp, he's in trouble. Right. I, I just, I cringe. I just, you never know. But, yeah. Um, so now here's the, uh, the meaty feedback, and so... Yep. Uh, Carmen, we've got a whole bunch of uh, juicy technical 
feedback, so you're, you're going to have to jump in with uh, Anthony and keep him honest. Oh, okay. Um, I can handle it. It's okay. We're going to start slow. So Tom J says, thanks for doing the show with the 80% arms. Listening to it now, it's now one of my new addictions. I just completed my fifth lower on the AR-15. Uh, now I'm saving up for the AR-10 jig. Keep up the good work. Once again, thanks for doing a show with 80% arms. And then Thomas G wrote in, read JW, great show. I've been thinking about tackling an 80% to widen my experience with the platform with the added benefit and pride of saying I finished the lower myself. I hadn't heard of doing it with a router, only a drill press. I have since watched the videos and think that it is much easier. On another note, uh, the show inspired my interest in uh, finishing up the curing oven I was building to do some Cerakote finishing for another added personalization with my builds. Yes. He said the rabbit hole never stops. No, it doesn't. That's why we have material for every show. So, Carmen... Now that you're um, knee deep or you know waist deep in the competitive world, do you do you have an ever increasing supply of ARs that begin to grace your your gun safe? Oh uh, no, no, I'm 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 I, um, I'm experimenting now, trying to uh, figure out what to build one. But I've been told that the shotgun is more important. I'm like, no, I love rifles, so. Um, I'm actually concentrating on shotgun right now, just because shotgun is easier. I'll knock the shotgun out and then spend my time building my ultimate rifle. You know, I got a Benelli M4, and if it didn't have such a short magazine tube, I think that would be an awesome three-gun rifle. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to see what a 10-round tube on that would work like. but. Well, I, 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 I just I, don't know. I can't complain though. I'm sporting the Night Force rifle right now, so you know the, the longer I go without my own rifle, the longer I get to shoot that one. Well, yeah, awesome. there is that. <laughs> I know. You don't um, hear any envy in this voice, no. So Thomas G goes on. I also want to thank you both for the insight on the red dot size choice. I was leaning towards the two MOA, but it was great to hear some validation of that choice. Most of my friends are both action and handgun guys so they don't have any experience in the black rifle madness. I didn't want to buy something at that price point and then have buyer's remorse. Yep. He says you can sell it and get something else, but you typically lose a bit of money. Exactly. Although in the higher end AR optics... Yeah, it, on the higher end, you don't always lose too much. I don't, do you gain much, though? I don't think you'll gain anything, but right. I think you hold your own. Right. Sorry, guys, I had to save you from a horrendous sneeze. All right, so Tim C. Uh, comes in and talks about direct impingement rifles and a problem he was having with 300 AAC blackout. So is 300 AAC used in any way in 3-gun? Are there any adherents, Carmen, or are there even rules that prohibit it? trying to think. I don't think so. They just changed the rules in the divisions. I don't know that anybody that anybody shoots it. Everybody I know that shoots it shoots it in, um, in high power. Yeah. I don't know that anybody shoots it in three gun. Yeah, because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it primarily they don't care too much what, you know, they have a minimum size but not a maximum and you can use however large you want to but typically you're going to use the minimum that's going to be needed to actually knock the target over if it's for steel targets. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much the mentality. Right. Um, and, I mean, you save on, I mean, because generally the, the heavier the round, the more expensive the round, the more specialized the round. Right. But, no, I don't think so. Well, if it's a matter of training budgets, I wouldn't think you'd want to get into 300 blackout. That stuff is a bit expensive. Yes. Just here. Just so, um... Tim's problem was that he was having intermittent issues with his rifle not cycling, and he did the standard, uh, um, oh, my mind went blank. Tap and rack? <laughs> um, troubleshooting. He was typical troubleshooting. So he started with buffers and buffer springs, um, and then uh, I think he lost a deer in a hunt, and so that really ticked him off. So, right. um, Understandably so. He started looking at his gas port size and what he basically came to the conclusion of 
after ruling out the size of his gas block was that the collar you typically find on the uh, government issue uppers for your handguards was the problem. In the absence of that collar, his uh, gas block was seating closer to that, um, what does he call it, the grind shoulder on the barrel right. right behind the gas block, and it was closing up the gas block because the hole in his gas block was not lining up with the hole in his barrel. Mm -hmm. So smaller opening, less gas, intermittent cycling problems. So what he basically said was, let's see, either in this case he shouldn't have had it on and he did or he did have it on and he shouldn't. I think that was the same thing twice. Anyways. Yeah. Well, you know, he I... figured it out and repositioned right. his gas block, solved his problem. Yeah. Who knew that there were different diameter sizes in your, in your gas block? I had well, no idea. All of us. We, we all did, Anthony. Me. The, the, the Except for those, <laughs> those of us with Dremels and only one bit. <laughs> the ports are all the same size and they're everywhere. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I think the thing is, and, and you know, this is what I do in my builds. I get a, uh, what do you call it, a paper clip. Right. I bend the end and I find the edge of the, the gas port in my uh, gas block. Okay. Um, and just basically do uh, an eyeball measurement. I don't get calipers or anything. I just stick my thumb on the edge and I just get a, a measurement from my thumb to the inside of that bent paper clip. And then I just basically eyeball it over my barrel to figure out whether my alignment's going to be such that I'm going to have a problem when I put my gas block on. Mm -hmm. And to date, I haven't had any alignment problems, so I haven't worried about it. Uh, the alignment well, problem he's looking at here is 0 0.03 inches of a difference. That's, well, and you have to think about it. If you have a 0 0.109 hole, right. and you just chop 0 0.03 off of Almost it. Almost 30% of it. Then you have a 0 0.79 opening, yep. and that's, that's a, a significant a difference. 0 0.079. Yeah, that's a significant difference. So... It, it does stand as a warning that you should do some basic uh, measurements to make sure that you're going to get your gas block lined up over your gas port and that it's going to not cause any difficulties because of the way you installed it. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great piece of feedback, though, so we definitely yeah. appreciate that, Tim. I know you and I have had uh, several discussions, and... Um, you know, I'm hoping that's not going to be the issue with uh, with my rifle since I changed out the um, the gas block on it originally before I started to try shooting because it feeds most everything just fine as brass. It's just those um, that weird uh, wolf ammo that it has a problem with. I think it's just the rifle. Yeah, probably. All right, so <laughs> I have a Dremel. Didn't you try to Dremel the front oh, side base Lord, off the right thing? You're right there. <laughs> Shh, quiet. What, what was that, Reed? <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> so Adam, Adam B. writes in. He says, hello, guys. I have a question. I get PSA deals in the mail almost every day. And they have some great prices on AR-15 upper and lower and parts also, uh, and parts also AR-10s. I guess the question is what kind of quality I'm looking to get with that brand. I've read some good things about them, but wanted your opinion on the rifle, please. Will they be comparable to, say, a DPMS, Smith & Wesson, or a SIG? He says, I have a SIG 400 Hunter Edition with a 1 and 8 twist, 20-inch barrel, and 556 that I can consistently shoot half-inch groups at 100 yards with my reloads using 50-grain ZMAX bullets. And he says, no, I'm not into the zombie thing at all but they are the same bullets as the VMAX, but green. Uh, he says the rifle he's looking to get will be 16-inch, 1-7, in or 1-8, in so I shoot about any grain weight bullet out of it, but wanted something for shorter, something shorter for plinking and home defense, just wanted to make sure I'm getting something reliable. 
what's the old saying? You get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I purchased from Palmetto State Armory, and I like their stuff. Uh, their uppers, uh, well, let's start off with their barrels. Uh, I think right now they're the biggest buyer of uh, FN barrels in the industry. Yep. Um, so their rifles come with a FN barrels, and their uppers come with FN barrels, and I, I don't know that you can beat an FN barrel for what it is. As far as durability, and they're not selling the, you know, the, baseline barrels. They're selling the, what, the M240B or the 249 saw barrels that are machined down for ARs. Those things will shoot, you know, 100,000 rounds of, you know, ammunition through a saw. So, I, I don't... Yep. No, so I, I see a lot of them um, at the range. I see a lot of palmettos. So. And, you know... You're you're not going to get a all bells and whistles, you know, prettied up, gussied up, you know, slick and silky finished kind of rifle. But you're going to get a rifle that's really well built, very well priced, that isn't going to give you problems. Well, and you 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 mentioned you bring up a good point. You know, you've got two sets. You got people who want guns that are reliable, and then people who want safe queens. And it's too complete. I mean, and occasionally you do run into the same thing, but really, you you have to really choose which one you want to be after. You really do. Yeah. And you know, if you have a bottomless pocket, you can get something that's super nice and super reliable and super fast and super light. But you know, that's a lot of money. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money. And yeah. then if you use it, it's not going to stay pretty for long. No. No. But um, Palmetto State, I think, is always going to be a good buy. You know, uh, we have to be informed to consumers. You have to get a good understanding of what you're buying. But I don't think you can go wrong with what they are being who they are right now. Yeah. Um, let's see. Our next piece of feedback is uh, a live fire feedback from Gepper. He says, you guys... Up to speed on the reclassification by ATF of the M855 green tips. Would love to hear your thoughts and also if there is anything we can do to fight back. My understanding is that really isn't armor piercing, but since it can be used in a pistol, it is, sort of. Well, Gepper, I, I hope this show <laughs> satisfies your need. We decided that we jump right on this for you. Um, let's see. Craig L. He says, AR-15 triggers. What would be the trigger you would buy for around $100 and for around $200 and your money is no object, best trigger out there? Carmen, I'm going to let you uh, start off on uh, your uh, one, two, three points wish list here. I know, what, I know what I want. I don't know if I can afford it, and I'm looking it up right now. I just don't look at prices. I just dream. Um, I want a Geisley more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, they are just supreme and I found this out a couple of years ago it was at SHOT and um, just playing around and I I got behind one and it was just incredible and I've just been kind of sorry enamored with them. No, that's alright. You're a... Yeah, the rifle that I'm fortunate enough to shoot right now has one on it and it's you're, just incredible. You're a shooter after the heart of our very own show because that is... <laughs> I think every rifle I have has Geisley in it. They're just incredible. So Are there, there are others. I would start out with an ALG defense for your yeah. under a hundred dollar trigger. Yeah, the, uh, like combat triggers between what sixty five and seventy five. Yeah, that advanced combat trigger. Um, it's got a uh, was it Teflon nickel. Trigger and a Teflon, or I mean a nickel boron, nickel Teflon trigger and a nickel boron hammer, or the other way around. But you know, it's like sixty-five dollars, and you're getting Geisley quality control. Um, the steels are hardened the way they're supposed to be. I had a gunsmith explain to me that if you file off too much of a standard mil spec garbage trigger, underneath that surface hardness is pudding. Yeah, exactly. So, Geisley isn't going to sell a trigger that you can file down to pudding. It is an awesome trigger. 
And for 65 bucks, I think it's well inside your price range, and it'll do everything uh, uh, any other $100 trigger in the industry will do, I think, right now. Well. <laughs> so in the $200 range, I don't know that... Oh, the Geisley SSA is 220. That's pretty close. Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to be a little over 200 for the Geisley stock triggers uh, that are, you know, the, the competitive stuff. Um, the I have the Super Dynamic Enhanced trigger. That's 250 dollars, and then I have the Three gun trigger, super three gun trigger, right? And that's two fifty. Um, I think both of them are just outstanding. A little more than um, the two hundred dollar range, but I think kind of close. Worth it in the end too, though. I mean, it's an. I do think so. Yeah. Have you guys had a chance to get behind any CMC triggers? It's I've shot them, and, and they're not bad at all. That's actually the one I was looking for. I was Googling trying to, to find that. Um, they're not bad at all. Yeah, their tactical is like 170. Yeah. yeah. It's a drop-in. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the difficulty in that space is that those companies that are with us are with us because they make good triggers. Yep. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, trigger monkey, a button monkey from, you know, back in the Marine Corps days. Nobody was talking about, you know, precision triggers. It was just about, you know, squeezing an orange. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's no finesse in my trigger pull. You know, I pull it. You know, that's all there is to it. Um, that being said, if you can get what you're looking for from a trigger, then it's dependent on what you're looking for and it's dependent on the trigger that gives it to you, not mm -hmm. on the manufacturer and not on the price tag. Um, you know, See, I've I'm tried... Go I'm, ahead. I'm a 1911 junkie, 2011. So I am all about the trigger because for me the trigger is the control, it's the accelerator, it's it's the it's the clutch, it's the throttle, it's the everything, you know. So depending on how on the reset, depending on whether it's got a positive reset or not, depends on whether or not I'm going to jam it, how fast I can pull. But then again, I'm thinking more like a USPSA shooter and not rifle. But then again, I, I want that, you know. Right. Well, you have to remember when I was in the Marine Corps, they uh, they had a three round burst because they wanted to instill fire discipline because. They, <laughs> Trigger monkeys would go in there and they'd depress the trigger and wait until it was empty 30 rounds later. You know, <laughs> change the magazine, do it again, you know. And uh, you put a three round burst in there and you keep that from happening. Oh, darn, that was only three. I need to reset. You know, let me do it again. <laughs> oh, darn, that was only three, you know. But, um, you know, I don't have those issues today. I'm not in that environment. I don't, I don't have that job anymore. So, you know, I still, I, I, I haven't gotten to the level where trigger interferes with my skill. You know, I can still put, you know, sub-MOA groups out of my 7mm Magnum with the original factory Remington trigger. But so, maybe you can do it faster with a Geisley. Well, I could, except for I have to, like, open the bolt and close it, but, you know... But, you know, with my ARs, yeah, I mean, I've got one with the Geisley on it, and I've just, I've never practiced long enough to ramp it up to get my sequence on. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. I went to a SHOT Show, uh, Industry Day at the Range, year before this one, got a chance to fire the, what, tactical fire control trigger, the one that's supposed to have the third position and, and let you just get in there and reset faster. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And I was talking with the engineer that developed it. Great guy. But he was looking at my trigger, and he says, you're military, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. He says, you're going to have to get over that whole, you know, mash the trigger thing of yours. And, you know, you, you have to have a delicate touch with it. Um, and, you know, 
I just don't have a delicate anything when it comes to my rifle. <laughs> I just shoot. Well, come on, you got to take care of your baby, man. I take care of it, but I'm not delicate when I use it. So there's no finesse in it, anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Geisley, but I've put hands on a lot of the other triggers, and they're all nice. They are. You, you can't be in that that part of the 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 field if you're not putting out quality because people will yep. not buy your stuff if it's garbage. When it comes to triggers, they won't. So, I'd say get your hands on, but I don't think you can go wrong starting with Geisley. No. Um, so I think that's all ALG is, uh, ALG is the, um, the baby brother of the Geisley, yeah. like you said. Yeah, for a starting point, under 100 bucks, I, I don't think there's any way you can go wrong with that. No. I've got three of those. I love those. Well, go ahead, Carmen. Okay, real quick, the nice thing about one of those triggers, too, is if you go to sell your AR, you can pop your Geisley out, keep it, and then throw the other trigger in there and sell it with that in there. Absolutely. Never get rid of the old trigger. Ever. <laughs> I think that's uh, pretty much a whole show under wraps. Yep. I think it's really been an awesome show. Carmen, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to let Anthony read us out. So, Carmen, if you want to just hang tight, then we'll be done in just a minute. Okay. All right, guys. As always, send us any questions or comments to feedback at ar15podcast.com. And please do uh, send those on in. We'd like to get those in the show. You can also send us a recorded voicemail, which we love to get and we rarely do, by using the SpeakPipe plugin on the right-hand side of the AR15 Podcast website. Subscribe and listen to the AR15 Podcast for free on iTunes or on Stitcher, and be sure to leave us a review so we can uh, place higher in searches for potential listeners. Share your picks with us on Instagram, and a lot of you guys are doing that. We're trying to get those into the show using at AR15 Podcast and tag your pictures with hashtag AR15 Podcast, or just tag us directly in the pictures at AR15 Podcast. Follow us on Google Plus to watch us live or over on Facebook. Our Google Plus is plus.google.com forward slash plus sign AR15 Podcast or just search AR15 Podcast. And the YouTube page is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash AR15 Podcast. And we are getting a lot of uh, great movement, a lot of great um, participation over on Facebook. So you guys come over on and join us. Let's see. Check out all the other great podcasts on the Firearms Radio Network at firearmsradio.tv and don't forget to use our Brownells affiliate link for all of your AR-15 parts and you guys are doing that quite well ar15podcast.com forward slash parts uh, Brownells again has that new Brownells Edge program be sure to check that out while you're over there and when you're buying anything and everything else you go to Amazon everybody does so go over to uh, firearmsradio.tv forward slash Amazon just before you go over to Amazon and that helps us out too it gives us just a little teeny tiny piece of that pie without affecting your pricing whatsoever all right well another great show we do want you to let us know what you thought about tonight's show especially because I think in the history of the AR-15 podcast this is the first time we have really touched on any controversial political issues yes um, we try to stay political free but I think this really kind of is an exception to the rule so let us know what you think and have a good week. Carmen, Anthony, have a good night. You too, Ray. Good night. Yeah. This has been a production of the Firearms Radio Network. You can find more information at firearmsradio.tv. 